Adam Braun, author of the bestseller, The Promise of a Pencil, used social media and his Wall Street experience to help raise funds and build 200 primary schools in developing countries. In the process, he also created a brand new business. Adam, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. So tell us, the cover of this book is captivating, but I did think, I suspected the story might be a tiny bit dull. <laughs> Yeah. But the audio version uh -huh. literally raised the hair on my arms, and you got yourself into quite a few scrapes. And unfortunately, <laughs> there's been mm. more a than few. one. Uh, the first one was on Semester at Sea. And uh, at the time, I was 21, just looking to really get outside of my comfort zone. And uh, I go on Semester at Sea, we leave from Vancouver, and I'm expecting to get to Korea in about two weeks' time. And unfortunately, uh, while crossing the North Pacific in winter, we got caught in between three superstorms. Uh, hundreds of miles from land, and the morning that we crossed the international date line, so we're as far as you can get from really any help or other ships or, or forms of land, uh, we were struck head on by a 60 foot rogue wave. And the wave went over the top of our ship, uh, shattered the glass on the sixth floor where the bridge was, and flooded the area with the power to the engines and the navigational equipment. So uh, we lost all power. Uh, to steer the ship, and in the meantime, we're in 45-foot swells. You Just, came this close to being washed into the sea. Right, and, and, and what happened was, uh, right after the wave hit, uh, this individual came over the loudspeaker, who we all knew as The Voice, because mm -hmm. it was literally just a voice, we'd never even met him, and he sounded incredibly panicked, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, get to the fifth floor higher, help the women and children up the stairs, and get to the muster stations. And for those that aren't familiar, which I hadn't been until I got on the ship, a muster station is where you go to evacuate a ship. I mean, when he said that announcement, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was dying in the next hour, that my life was coming to an end. And um, within that recognition uh, was the acknowledgement that one, at some point in time, my life was going to perish. And that once I perished, the only thing that would be left behind was the legacy of the life that I had lived. And it forced me to start asking these bigger questions. I had this total calm and stillness come over me, and there was not hope or belief, it was knowledge that it was not my time, that there was something that was gonna pull me forward and make sure that I survived. So knowledge as in just a feeling, a strong it, a conviction. I mean, it's beyond a feeling or a conviction, mm. it's, it's pure in its essence. It was, there's no doubt. Mm. My life does not add up to 21-year-old man perishes at sea, mm -hmm. that I'm here for a reason, and it is not this. Mm. And within that was, for the very first time, a sense of true purpose. And it's almost the inversion of, you know, knowing it's not meaning uh, disappearing at sea today means that it must be something else. Right. And that set me on the path that I'm on today, which was pursuit of purpose. So what was the catalyst that made you start Pencils of Promise? The catalyst was one night where I went to the Philharmonic Symphony. I had never been to a symphony before and I'm watching this man just play with such passion and he's crushing the keys and um, you know just kind of the, I was enraptured as was the whole room and I'm looking at him and I remember this distinct thought uh, and this idea that if he feels as passionate about this one instrument um, as I could feel about anything then that would really be living mm -hmm. and I wanted to get back to that feeling and, and you literally had lost that I, I had moved away from it I, mm -hmm. I, you know my first year in New York I just create a very self-absorbed life for myself, work and social and work and social and how could I get into this party and how could I appease this one client and I had kind of moved away from the sense of service mm -hmm. that um, truly made me feel most alive. Mm. And this name popped in my head, Pencils of Promise, and it was like a lightning bolt went through me. I mean, electric, you know. And uh, I knew in that moment that I could go find a way to build one school and use mm -hmm. what Bain calls their externship opportunity to create an organization that enabled one school to be built somewhere in the developing world. And I went to the bank uh, a couple days later and I said, what does it take to open up a bank account? And the woman said, you have to start with at least $25. And I was turning 25 that yes. month. So I thought it was a good karmic sign. I put $25 in and that was the beginning of, of Pencils of Promise. And you've said that millennials are all about meaning. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in five or 10 years we're going to see that almost every company has some kind of philanthropic portion to it? So my hope is that every single company mm. in five or ten years has some type of philanthropic component to it, but my expectation is not so much around the philanthropic incorporation, but the incorporation of purpose. And I think a lot of people confuse the two. Mm -hmm. And they sense that to have purpose, it means that you need to be giving back to those in poverty, or you need to be solving for 
AIDS or cancer or diabetes or one of these um, diseases that in a lot of individuals obviously are very passionate about solving for. Mm -hmm. My biggest belief is that humans derive their greatest power from senses of purpose. And purpose comes mm -hmm. from service to others as well as solving a societal need. Mm -hmm. And so my expectation is that going forward, the axis that we evaluate most companies on, which is nonprofit mm -hmm. or for-profit, mm -hmm. is going to become far less meaningful than a separate axis that will evolve, which I define as for-purpose or non-purpose. And that mission-driven companies that stay true to mission-driven outcomes will succeed, whether they're nonprofits or for-profits, but it's the mission itself. If they work on solving the mission, either the profits will increase mm -hmm. or the, in the nonprofit structure, the outcomes that they will produce will be greater. So tell us about the countries that you're in and how that works. So we started in Laos mm -hmm. and Southeast Asia, then we grew into Nicaragua and Guatemala, and now we're in Ghana as well. And so the idea was to create a global organization and demonstrate a best practice model for increasing access to quality education for uh, children that were in rural, rural poverty for mm -hmm. the most part. With some of them without any school at all. Correct. Yeah. In Ghana, we go into communities where there's literally kids under mango trees if they're able to go to school at all, and it's a chalkboard up against a tree. So how do you first make contact yeah. with, a, say, a brand new country? How do you go in? <laughs> so each of the four countries where we have historically worked has started with me putting on a backpack and getting on a flight down to a country and, and kind of figuring hi. it out. Yeah, figuring it out uh, from the ground up. But now the organization has gotten to a place of size and sophistication where there would probably be a tremendous amount of research, a tremendous amount of outreach, and we would uh, essentially identify a country and a region that really meets our criteria around political stability, around economic indicators for need, and ultimately active partnership from mm -hmm. the government, the mm -hmm. education ministry, and the communities. Then we say to those communities, you have to put in 10 to 20% of the funding for every project that we undertake. Uh, increasingly, it's 20% or more mm -hmm. from every single community. But the issue is these are people that are living on 300 to $600 of annual income for the whole family. Wow. So they don't have the excess capital to put into their school creation, but what they can provide are materials and labor. Mm -hmm. So we help communities self-organize so that mothers and fathers and elders and siblings are physically building the school that the next generation of children in their community will then attend. And it creates a sense of ownership sure, and yeah. commitment and co-investment mm -hmm. so that when the school is opened, they're not looking for the Westerner to come over and fix it. Right. It's we created this and we need to sustain it going forward. Right. And where do the teachers come from? Are they in the villages already? So the teachers often come uh, from what's referred to as the teacher's college. What we saw was that building schools were effective, but we needed great teachers. Mm -hmm. And so the second program that we launched was a teacher training program, mm -hmm. and then eventually uh, now a student scholarship program as well, so that when kids finish our primary schools, they can see and get supported through their educational track into secondary school. So you met an entrepreneur who slighted you, and mm -hmm. I think, I mean, we all know that feeling. It's, yeah. it's horrible, but you talk about it very honestly, mm -hmm. and it led you to create a brand new type of business. So right. tell us what happened. So I was on a, a rooftop gathering a company launch and I was speaking with a venture capitalist and because my background had been in finance before that for the most part, you know, I can speak that language. And about 20 minutes in he said, so what do you do? And I gave the standard answer, well, I run a nonprofit that I started called Pencils of Promise. And his eyes just glazed over and he immediately looked for the next person to talk to. And I don't think it was intentional that he was trying to slight me, but... But he was done with you. Yeah, yeah. He immediately recognized a term that for some reason we all use in this space that strips all of our work of its value and its power. Yeah. And I literally said, I run a nonprofit, worthless in value almost. And, and he kind of shut off and started to look for somebody else. And I recognized that this term just needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about why people get in this space. And it's really for two reasons, in my opinion, either to lift others out of poverty through increased profitability mm -hmm. or uh, to increase the sense of meaning and purpose in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And so I said, we're going to stop calling our organization and our work a nonprofit as much as we are mm -hmm. um, and call it for purpose instead. And we're going to think about maximization of impact and maximization of uh, return on investment for the capital that we're able to amass mm -hmm. uh, instead of minimizing everything and always saying, hey, look, we're a charity and you know, pity us because we're helping people in poverty mm -hmm. and say, no, no, we're a mission-driven organization. Our tax status is a 501c3 nonprofit, but 
we don't exist to not profit. We exist to solve a very real problem, which is lack of access to education. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I shared it uh, on stage at the Google Zeitgeist conference, um, there was this kind of audible gasp. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a sense of recognition from a business community that was in the room that said, that's what I've been looking for. Hmm. So what about a company, someone who's running a company mm -hmm. who, which is, has no um, charitable element to mm -hmm. it or for purpose profit, mm -hmm. purpose to it, How, what would they do? Would they just add extra goals, like they've got, we have to reach this, this, and this, mm -hmm. and then add on some philanthropic goals? Well, if they want to become more profitable, I think they should. Hmm. So this is another interesting component, hmm. which is you can achieve your own business objectives by incorporating philanthropy mm -hmm. into the business itself. Now. 20 years ago, I wouldn't have made that same statement, but the culture has shifted. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the data around consumer preferences, 84% mm -hmm. of people will switch from one brand to another if all else is equal, and one brand creates a positive social impact. Across, across all ages? Well, it's even higher within millennials. Mm -hmm. It's over 90%. Right. But the 84 is the average. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing is a shift in consciousness amongst consumers that they want to vote with their dollar and they want to get value from whatever product they're buying, mm. but they also have a latent expectation that it's not going to hurt the world and ideally it helps the world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And would you, um, if you had to do it all over again, yeah. would you go to Wall Street from your, from college to Wall Street or not? Well. I'm happy with the path that I took, and uh, when I worked at Bain, uh, not on the Wall Street side, but on the consulting side, I learned so much about what it takes to great, build a great business. Mm -hmm. I learned so much about how to create internal culture, mm -hmm. uh, about investment in other individuals, about building up their capacity to lead, mm -hmm. and without that training, Pencils of Promise wouldn't be anywhere close to where it is today. Mm -hmm. And so, in a lot of ways, I would say yes, it mm -hmm. was really essential for me to go work at a company like Bain and mm -hmm. gain the capability to operate in the for-profit world and then essentially extract yes. the business acumen that lives there and try and bring it into solving a humanitarian issue. Well, Adam, thank you so much for coming My today. Pleasure. It's really an important read. It's a great read about an important issue. So thanks thank you. very much it for that. A lot.